Hey everybody, Ryan here and welcome back to our oral surgery series. In this video we'll talk about trauma, jaw fractures, and orthognathic surgery. So mandibular fractures are a common result of orofacial trauma. They're best evaluated with a panoramic x-ray and in order of frequency, condylar fractures are most common, followed by angle fractures, those are at or near the gonial angle of the mandible between the body and the ramus, and then symphysis fractures. And these are generally the three most common mandibular fractures we see. Condylar neck fractures are most common because the bone dimension in this area is skinniest and the condyle gets banged up against the glenoid fossa and is trapped there and has nowhere else to go. Commonly, a fall or blow to one side of the mandible causes a fracture in the angle region of the ipsilateral side and a fracture of the condylar region of the contralateral side. So if you fall on your right side, you can get a gonial fracture on your right side and a condylar fracture on your left side. Some terms to know for the board exam, green stick fractures means it's not all the way through the layer of bone. Commun comminuted fractures mean it's crushed into multiple fragments. A simple fracture, so that means it's closed to the oral cavity, whereas a compound fracture means it's open to the oral cavity. In other words, the bone is exposed through the mucosa near the teeth. Then we have mid-face fractures. These are potentially more serious fractures resulting again from orofacial trauma. These are best evaluated with a CBCT since they're out of view of the panoramic. The Lafort 1 fracture is a horizontal fracture across the maxilla and we see this in the first image down here. Lefort 2 fracture is a pyramidal fracture, hence why it's shown here as this triangular shape. It involves the medial orbit and the nasal bone up here in addition to the maxilla. And finally, we have a Lefort 3 fracture, which is a complete craniofacial disjunction. And now we're involving both sides of the orbit and it's a complete fracture from left to right of the skull. We also have a zygomatico-maxillary complex fracture, formerly known as a tripod fracture. It was called a tripod fracture because it involved three fracture lines, one at the lateral orbit, one at the maxilla, and one at the zygoma or the zygomatic bone. This type of fracture is caused by a direct blow to the malar eminence, or the cheekbone part, and it typically involves this symptom that is bleeding under the conjunctiva of the eye. So if you see a board question keying you into bleeding under the conjunctiva, that could lead you to believe that that patient experienced a zygomaticomaxillary complex fracture. And of course, this name is a combination of the zygomatic bone and the maxillary bone, both of which are involved in that fracture. So what can we do about mandibular fractures and mid-face fractures? So my knowledge on this topic is admittedly limited, but here are the basics for board prep. And these are some big picture terms to know for trauma surgery. So reduction refers to fracture fragments being returned to their normal position. And we have two main types of reduction. Open reduction means that fracture fragments are exposed surgically by dissecting the tissues, whereas closed reduction means that fracture fragments are manipulated without surgical exposure. We see these terms open and closed again. We saw those before when we were talking about fractures. If they were open, to the oral cavity where we could see that bone or if they were closed. And the same terminology is being used here. 
Next we have internal fixation. This means that we're using titanium bone plates or screws to hold bone together. And you can see these titanium mini plates shown in the image below here, holding the fracture lines, the uh, fractured pieces together following the reduction surgery. Intermaxillary fixation, IMF for short, it's also called maxillomandibular fixation or MMF for short. This means that we're wiring the jaws together or placing arch bars and elastics so you can control the force vectors and restore the occlusion between the maxilla and the mandible. Now it's a point of contention if intermaxillary fixation is actually necessary or not. Mandib mandible fractures are ideally treated with open reduction and internal fixation, and you can combine those two as ORIF. And so that would be the quote-unquote ideal treatment method for a mandible fracture if they ask you that on the board exam. So again, it's a, it's a point of contention if ORIF is sufficient or if you also need intermaxillary fixation for mandibular fracture cases. But again, according to board materials out there, mandible fractures are ideally treated with this method. So occlusion is used to guide the surgeon during repair of the fracture, and an occlusal splint is used for about four to six weeks, and it's often enough to hold the jaws in place. But where a patient is edentulous or partially edentulous, occlusion may be indeterminate after the fracture and then intermaxillary fixation may need to be considered in that case. So our next big problem to consider are skeletal discrepancies. And here are some definitions, some very overarching definitions to know for the board exam. Retronathic mandible refers to a class two skeletal discrepancy. A prognathic mandible, one that sticks too far out, refers to a class three skeletal discrepancy. Apertonathic is a not often used term, but that's referring to a skeletal anterior open bite. And this is coming from the word aperture, meaning opening. Vertical maxillary excess means that the maxilla has grown down too far, it's too long, often resulting in a gummy smile. A horizontal transverse discrepancy it's also known as a skeletal posterior crossbite. And then we have macrogenia, which means the chin is too big, or microgenia, the chin is too small. So th these are some basic definitions for some skeletal discrepancies. So how do we fix those? Well, we can do orthodontics, or in some cases, the ideal treatment method would be orthognathic surgery. And this is used to correct severe skeletal discrepancies by manipulating the upper and or lower jaws. So lateral cephs are the main x-ray images used in treatment planning these cases. Now this is what you should know for the board exam, but I would argue that cone beam CTs are becoming more and more routinely used in orthognathic cases because with 3D imaging, you can superimpose color maps to predict and assess surgical treatment outcomes. So an acrylic splint is often used intraoperatively. Again, we're using occlusion to guide our surgical outcome and result. A Lafort 1 osteotomy can be used to move the maxilla. A BSSO can be used to move the mandible. And a genioplasty can be used to alter the chin anatomy. So let's dive into Lafort 1 and BSSO in the next couple slides here. So a Lafort 1 osteotomy is where we would purposely separate the maxilla and essentially create a Lafort 1 fracture in order to free up and move the upper jaw forward, upward, etc. So this can be used for a retrusive maxilla or vertical maxillary excess, probably the most commonly treated severe skeletal discrepancies, but there are more out there.
A BSSO stands for bisagittal split osteotomy, and this is used for retrusive or protrusive mandibles. So we can either set back the mandible or bring it forward. So we're making cuts on either side of the mandible above the inferior alveolar nerve and down the side of the ramus here. So the most common post-op complication is nerve damage. And that makes sense because of the proximity of the inferior alveolar nerve. So neurosensory disturbances like paresthesia or loss of sensitivity are very common with this type of surgery. Now the condyle position following the surgery should be unaltered ideally. And so we're just moving this lower portion of the mandible around in order to improve the skeletal discrepancy. So in a case example on the board exam, if a patient is class three, well, that's not enough information for us. We need to know if it's because of a maxillary deficiency or a mandibular excess that that patient is class three skeletal. So if it's a maxillary problem, then we would treat them with a Lafort. If it's a mandibular problem, then we treat them with a BSSO. And if it's a combination of both, then a double jaw surgery, which could, would combine the Lafort and the BSSO together, would be the treatment of choice. So for the board exam, that's really all you need to know for the basics, the very general, big picture, high yield basics of orthognathic surgery. So distraction osteogenesis, or DO for short, there are a lot of uh, shortened acronyms and things to, you don't necessarily have to remember, but if it helps you remember them for the board exam, then you can definitely remember uh, the shortened words, the shortened names for these surgical procedures. So distraction osteogenesis refers to bone deposition between two bone surfaces that are separated by gradual traction. So for bone lengthening, this is how distraction osteogenesis works, where it really excels, but it doesn't work for adding bone width. So the first phase of distraction osteogenesis is the osteotomy phase. And so this is where the surgeon would actually cut the bone into two pieces. The second phase is the latency phase, where an appliance is mounted to the bone on each side of the cut, but it's not actually activated for at least one week afterwards. Then the third phase is the actual distraction phase where the appliance is activated and is used to gradually separate those two pieces, allowing new bone to fill in to the gap here. So distraction osteogenesis is another surgical strategy that offers potentially bigger and more stable movements. So you can think of this similar to how bone is deposited at the mid-palatal suture during rapid palatal expansion, except now we're essentially creating our own suture, or our own cut between two pieces of bone and separating them mechanically. All right, so that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. If you're interested in supporting the channel, please check out my Patreon page a huge thank you to Michael Raja and all of my patrons for their continued support. And I have to add, we recently hit our goal, which allowed me to purchase a brand new professional microphone. So hopefully you're enjoying this added audio quality to the videos. And you can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and additional practice questions. So go check out my Patreon page. The link will be in the description below. Thanks again for watching, everyone. I'll see you all in the next video.